Welcome to those participating live and to those watching the recording. The OU's Department of Community Engagement is committed to providing resources and professional de development opportunities to synagogue youth professionals. This webcast titled Innovative Youth Programming Techniques will be presented by Matt Dorder and Ryan Canuel. Matt and Ryan are directors of Main Stages, an educational theater company providing creative programs and consulting on theatrical services at organizations and summer camps nationwide. Building on the concept of edutainment, Main Stages develops programs designed to engage the five senses, inspire social action, and strengthen theatrical arts in educational settings. At main stages, activities and programs are kid tested with over 15,000 ch children yearly. You will notice on the bottom of the page that there is a discussion um, opportunity. If you post your questions, we will hopefully get to them by the end of the webcast. Thank you and enjoy. Hello. Hi everybody. Hi. Uh, I'm Matt Dorder, Executive Director of Main Stages. And I'm Ryan Canuel. I'd like to give a little bit of background about how we got started with what we do because the power of stories um, is a very effective way of engaging kids of all ages. My father was a history teacher um, and I remember when I was a kid studying for a history exam I would turn to my dad and I would ask him these facts so that I could remember them for the test. Dad, what, what was the reason why America entered World War I? And what I'm looking for is the sinking of the Lusitania, those five words that I can then write down and get the answer correct. And my dad would start in and he would say, well, back in the late 1800s, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and I'm like, oh no, this is going down a very long, road and my grades are going to be impacted accordingly. Dad, why can't you just give me the one answer that I can then put in my test, get the answer correct, and then go ahead and forget it immediately afterwards. And then I realized that that particular answer, the sinking of the Lusitania, is not actually what would have started America entering World War I. There's all these different things going on in the background. And that's when I first realized that there was a, a difference between the nuances of reality um, and the memorization of facts in a classroom. And educational settings suffer because children learn better through creative exploration than memorization. And Ryan and I have theater backgrounds, and so when we looked at engaging children in the activities that we did across the country, we look at it from how can we engage children creatively? How can we incorporate all of the elements that make an innovative activity for kids? Um, and that's why we're so excited to have the opportunity to speak with people um, on the other end of a camera, uh, but either way, give you a sense of some of the techniques that we found have worked for us. Um, now, let's start with some innovative keys, of, uh, some keys for innovative programming. And I, I, let's, let's first make a commitment to the people here behind this camera. Um, one, we would love to have feedback. A impactful, innovative program has to be, and this is what we're going to aim to do, right? What are we going to aim to do? Well, today... I think uh, you know this is a bit of a different setting for us that we're that we're used to, um, but nonetheless, we really hope one of our commitments is to entertain you today. Absolutely, we don't want to just be one voice talking into a void, right? Any activity with children should incorporate entertainment. Should it absolutely, not? absolutely. Children love the entertainment. Uh, we hope to change things up, uh, be a little bit different. I think, uh, uh, you know, from from maybe some other webcasts that we've been that we've seen or that you might have experienced. Yes, sure. absolutely should not be traditional. We will incorporate personal stories. Right, just how, just how I sort of started. Um, 
kids can see honesty and kids can see where you're coming from when you are intending on engaging them and getting them on your side in a program that you're leading. So coming from a place of honesty is pretty crucial. We also hope to uh, be informative uh, and make things accessible to you, excuse me. Uh, and so certainly after this, we have some materials that we would love to share and send out if anybody is interested, uh, and we would love to stay in contact as well. Certainly. I mean, you can email us um, at uh, mainstages.com. You can also tweet us uh, at mainstages, um, as well as certainly feel free to communicate with us through the webcast. Absolutely. And of course, uh, uh, considering our audience today, we would love to definitely share some examples and use examples for Jewish programming. Yeah, absolutely. Jewish program will be the context so that you can get a little bit more of a grounded understanding. We also want to be high energy. Ah! Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll do that for you, uh, and we'll have a lot of fun, and hopefully you will enjoy your experience as well. Um, and, and, and thinking about starting, really, uh, in, in any situation where you're working with kids, teens, no matter what it is, even in a situation like this with adults, you always want to think about starting by setting expectations. Um, kids need structure, we all need structure. As much as they, they'll rebel against it and say that they don't need it, they, they really do. They, you know, they sort of expect certain things to happen within the classrooms or the programs that they have, and when they're not there, it's it's a bummer or it might be a little bit different and off throwing. Um, and so the things that we would like to do is sort of set those expectations because then you talk about um, you're bringing in the community, uh, and that's what we really like to do. We separate it in talking about uh, the expectations that we have as facilitators, and so I think we we, we covered that a little bit in, in terms of the expectation that we have for you and, and what we hope to do for you uh, during this time, as well as giving that ownership to the, to the other side, the participants, the kids, and having them participate and take ownership of the expectations by saying what they hope to get out of it. And of course, just like we mentioned, we're not going to do it in any normal way. We've done these uh, sort of workshops before, and we, we hear a lot of the same things in, in terms of working with kids. Uh, and so we're just going to talk about some different examples of uh, some of the expectations that you might have for us, and we we'll hope to meet those today. Certainly, you can email what you'd like to see and make sure that we cover it over the time of the webcast. But um, yeah, we'll just play you for now with a variety of characters, if that's okay. Absolutely. I think that sounds like a lot of fun. Usually we would write it up so that you can post it and have it hanging there so that the entire community, the group that you're working with, can see it. And also when you set expectations, this is a great management tool, I think, that it doesn't become about you against the participant when an expectation is broken. You say, you're part of a community, we, we have these expectations that we've set a, aside for the community to sort of adhere to, and you're not following those community rules. So it doesn't hinder that relationship that you're trying to build when you're connecting with uh, your participants. And there's something about writing things down that gives cred credibility to children's viewpoints as well. Absolutely. So let's get right into this. So class, here we are today. You yes. know our expectations. I would love to give you an opportunity uh, uh, how about some ideas of what you expect to get out of the next half an hour, 45 minutes during this webcast? Oh, yes, of course. Jack from England. Yes, what would you like to see? Why, thank you, sir. Uh, I would love to see some uh, effective techniques for different age groups, right? Like all the way from 3 to 16, there's probably a variety of people working with different ages here. I'd love to get an idea across the board what some nice techniques might be. Absolutely. I think we can handle that for you. We Cheers, will talk Captain. about We will talk about activities that are uh, specific for younger kids as well as activities that will be work well with uh, teens. I think we can certainly cover that. So Cheers. age range, you're welcome. Any other ideas of uh, some different uh, expectations that you might have over the next step? Yes, Sarah from Ireland. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, what would be some great ideas for uh, a structure, a lesson plan, like how is there, is there a set way that we'd be able to put things together? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I, I think that's a great idea. A simple structure that uh, anyone can sort of use in, in terms of taking their ideas and putting them down so that they have them and can share them with other people to do their programming. I think we can certainly handle that. Very nice. Uh, how, about, how about we get one more? How about we get one more? Are there any? I don't any, see any. Oh, how about this person? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Tim from Australia. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, mate, um, I think that if we can, um, if we can figure out how to get in a good uh, mindset, mate, uh, and we can uh, generate good ideas. How do we brainstorm? That's terrible so brainstorming. You get the idea. Brainstorming. Part of part of innovative programming is sort of being fearless and being confident um, and having a pretty terrible Australian accent. <laughs> okay. anyway, but the idea, the right? Okay, thank you. The first sentence, maybe. But um, yes, it, uh, the, the idea of um, of brainstorming and how to like get in a creative place to say this is the activity. How do we make it innovative? How do we make it something? And the challenge there was that I don't think Matt knew what different accents I was throwing. No, in. I did not. <laughs> we did rehearse, but he had used different ones yesterday, so thank you for that. Uh, and so we have the class's expectations. We've talked a little bit about the goals that we're going to be doing throughout this. And, and, and then it's really important to talk about the specific expectations that you have for the groups that you're working with. Um, for this one, um, some of the expectations that we have for you is, is to challenge yourself. Always challenge yourself. Ask yourself questions, uh, especially when you take the tools that you receive today and start trying them. Um, you know, uh, it's not always going to be comfortable. It might not always be easy, but that's part of the learning process. And so be okay with challenging yourself. Um, that takes me into the next one of, you know, try these things. Take them out and, and put them to use. Um, if, they don't work for you, understandable, you know, not everything is going to work for everyone. Think outside the box. This is one that we're definitely going to go into a little bit later in terms of brainstorming and thinking about a variety of ways of taking, you know, one program and changing it up. Um, and then uh, have some fun. Uh, please be interactive as possible. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll have some different ways that you can interact with us even though we're not sitting in the same room. Uh, and of course, always uh, send us your questions because uh, we would love to hear them and respond to them. Let's, let's talk for a second before we delve in and, and you know, we're building, we're, we're, we're designing this to showcase the actual facilitation techniques while we're also talking about the facilitation techniques. Um, so we're doing a beginning, a middle, and an end. So we've just previewed what we're working on. We've set what we're hoping the goals are, what your expectations are, and what our expectations are. But before we talk about some strip, like real logistics, let's think about some of the things that stifle creativity. I've spent a lot of time working in Jewish nonprofit worlds. And a lot of the times, there's a sense of, oh, that's not going to work for our people, that for our population. That's not going to work at this time. Um, and I think that there needs to be a mindset sort of from the top down about this idea of, of comfort with trying new things mm -hmm. and, and saying it's okay. You know, one of the um, main improv games that we use in some of our theater classes is called um, Yes And. Um, and it's designed to sort of keep a scene going. You would say, it's raining, I would say, oh, it's raining outside. Yes. And we should grab our umbrellas to protect us from the water. Yes, and there's also elephants falling from the sky. Yes, and I noticed that they are very tiny elephants, which is really interesting. Terrific. Thank you. So the idea is if you said, no, it's not raining, or it's going to rain, or those aren't elephants in the sky, then the ideas and the concepts when you're planning and when you're thinking, they get stifled right off the bat. So. When you're planning, let's say, a program as an educator or you know, a big event for your synagogue or you're a teacher and it's part of your daily class, when you're thinking and when you're planning your activities, to allow yourself to quiet the, the voices that are telling you why something won't work. And what's great is, before you're going to go ahead and try it, you're going to run it through your head. So allow yourself the permission to say, this would work. This is going to be okay. 
this might be a crazy idea, but I'm gonna keep it on the board and I'm gonna yes and it and I'm gonna build onto it. And it might not be exactly what you would put out there, which was sort of wild and zany, but it will possibly be an, an iteration that is still braver and something newer that has a, a strong impact more than something that you might do because it's traditional and safe. So that idea of allowing yourself to take those risks um, as part of creativity. Um, also, there's this idea of, of a fear of failure, a fear of an act activity not working or, or a concept not working. Um, and one of the nice ways of of sort of quieting that is to plan. And even though adaptability and creativity is so important in creating an innovative youth program, the idea of still creating the structure and still operating within habits and rituals, it creates that sort of sense of structure that you know works. And that's why it was so important for us to start with that beginning, the middle, and the end. Um, and then the other idea is to bring in different voices. This, I think, is really, really important. You know, if you're a teacher and you sit there and you create your lesson plans by yourself every day, you could be brilliant. You could, you could be creative. You can, you can have the most fantastic ideas, but you don't really know how those are reflecting with other people. So look at your organization or look at the people who are your potential partners and try to invite people who are a representation of different backgrounds odd skill sets unique talents invite the maintenance person when you're planning your Yom Ha'atzmaut Israel Israel day let them say oh well here's an idea here's a concept I'd, I'd love to add on to that in, in terms of bringing other people and other voices and uh, we've mentioned this and, and we're going to continue talking about it but to educators and in education storytelling is everything. You know, Matt was mentioning the beginning, middle, and end as a structure for how you start to create things. You know, it's the same thing with the story. Every story has a beginning and a middle and end. That's what we tell our kids, and that's how we start, and that's how we get that concept out there. Um, and in terms of storytelling, I think counselors or educators that when you're talking with them initially that are great storytellers that have these elaborate stories about uh, you know, working with kids or, you know, this great fond memory that they have. Those sorts of people are, are going to to sort of rack their brains for those different ideas, as well as be very engaging for kids. Uh, you know, you get a great storyteller in front of kids, you know, you tell one story, and it might last, you know, 30 minutes that you've had this person just creating a story and telling a story. Um, and so I just wanted to mention, in terms of bringing in other voices, storytelling is so key to, to what we do in, in terms of innovative facilitation, certainly, as well as good educators, I, I think. Absolutely. So, so we've sort of given ourselves permission to drop all of the why it's not going to work and all of the fear and all of what's going on in our head. And we've brought a couple people together who represent a couple different ideas, a couple different concepts, and we've laid that groundwork with them as well. Let's throw some ideas together. Let's do some brainstorming. Mm -hmm. um, Let's go over a couple of different brainstorm techniques that will help you generate some innovative ideas. Um, I like to do, or we like to do, this um, three-step approach. And we'll, we'll stick with the Yom Ha'atzmaut Israel programming that you're doing, okay? And so let's say we're a, um, a synagogue, okay? And it's... It's Israel Independence Day, and so we're pulling together a program where people can volunteer and come. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, it's just a volunteer event. Um, first question, how has it been done in the past? What are some of the proven activities, some of the, some of the proven ideas? What's been some of the things that have worked? What are some of the things that don't work? And let's look at that. Let's write it down on the board, as we discussed. And that is the beginning. We talk about not having to recreate the wheel. What you want to do is recreate the recreation of the wheel. Mm. So we have the way that it works. Now, the next step is, how can we do it differently? Now notice, it's not better, it's not worse, it's just differently. What are some different ideas? Right? We've already set that groundwork that 
we're not going to you know say this isn't going to work we're going to yes and onto these ideas so we say oh if we've done our uh, co-tell where the children wrote their messages how can we do that differently when we do it the next time right or what are some extra ideas so you add those to the board as well and the third one is the what is the wildest weirdest way that we can do it so you're sort of looking at the very realistic very tangible how it's been done before a basic brainstorm where what are some new ideas what are some new concepts and then the like what is the craziest way? What's the way that we're going to do it? And now you've got this wide group over here. That's your sort of like big analysis of ideas and concepts. You want to talk about a couple of ways of sort of generating more of those ideas? Some of those Absolutely. Ideas we, have? It, it, we, we have a list of activities that, of course, we would love to send out to you if you're interested. Um, but just to highlight some of them, one of my favorites is this resource availability. We all, the, Matt was talking about the fear and the thing that stifles creativity. We're all in organizations where budgetary considerations have to happen. They have to happen. And it's such a hard thing to get around. And, and of course, you know, it's so easy to just say, no, that, that, that's way too expensive. We can't do that. Um, and so one of the things that we like to do is take resources, availability, and, and money, every, all those things out of the equation. Throw it all out the window. Money is no object. Because the great thing is... Do you hear them laughing? I hear them laughing. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, this is impossible. What are these guys thinking? Uh, throw it out the window, because then that gives you the freedom that Matt was talking about to sort of grab for those big, wacky, big ideas. Um, and it might surprise you that somebody in the room or somebody, somebody you know might know a way of doing that specific thing in an affordable way um, and it's something that you might not have said before because you thought oh, you know this is going to be too expensive I won't even think about mentioning it but now it's out there and somebody can think about it and figure out different ways to do it and it's not just a financial resource in that example it could be you know oh we would need too many staff for right. that and things like that but if you throw those on the idea list you can look at them and you could try to put them in a rational context um, a little bit later while still uh, broadening your horizons to try new things. For sure. Uh, another one is role storming or brain writing. This, uh, this, uh, sorry, uh, brain writing. So you start, everyone has a piece of paper, you have your topic, you have your theme, you have the goals of where you're going, uh, and you start writing down ideas. Just a few minutes, sort of off the top of the head, just writing down, and then you switch papers. Then people have this different point of view on who was thinking about other ideas, and you get to add on to those ideas, and they begin, they, they begin to build and grow. And it also feeds in really nicely to your sense of community. You're all sort of working together and building on, you know, building with each other, as opposed to throwing ideas at each other, in a sense. Yeah, another, another fun one that, that really gets you thinking sort of outside of what you traditionally do is, is imagining that you're someone else. You are Spider-Man and you're planning your Israel day. You are 100 years in the future. What does that program look like? You're 100 years in the past. You're someplace else. You are in Israel planning your Israel day. How does that differ from being in New York City planning your Israel day? Um, these ideas open you up to thinking in a different way and generating those different ideas. And the last one I would like to mention is the role storming. That's basically taking on the role of people in your community, the, the parents, the volunteers, literally sitting in, in their seat, sort of taking on their perspective and their understanding to sort of ask questions to your board of directors or program directors that they might be thinking about. So, you know, take on the role of a kid or a, and maybe even facility workers, maintenance people, you know, because, you know, sometimes those things are overlooked, but they're huge logistics and maybe even they can help you in some of the sense as well. So living in those shoes and sort of seeing it from a completely different perspective can again open up your creative mind to coming up with great ideas. Great, so we, we've sort of talked a little bit now about what our goals are, expectations, setting the beginning of your class and how that should work, um, and then also generating these ideas and utilizing people and beginning to think outside the box. 
let's let's get right into some hands-on facilitation techniques and strategies for different age groups, shall we? Absolutely, I'm so ready. Okay. Well, the question is not if you're ready, Ryan. Although you'll be, you're welcome to play. It's the question is if they're if they're ready. This is really easy, okay? All I need you to do is clap your hands at the same time as me. Really easy, okay? So you just got to make sure that all you got to do, I mean, are you guys playing on the other side? Did you get, I think they got it over there. Well, one of the really important things that is really valuable to do with kids is a first impression. You know, when the kids come in, they, <laughs> when, when the kids come in, they, they can size up whether this is going to be something cool faster than you could say, wow, that's not cool. So the idea is a couple different strategies for how to prep for a good start, okay? We love, because let's say your Israel day starts at 10 a.m. And at 9.40, four or five kids starting to come in. They come in, the room's kind of dark, maybe they're not quite prepped, they look around, there's no real activity yet. First impression, what am I doing here? What's happening, right? So we always think about in terms of an activity before the activity. Um, and one of the valuable things to do with all ages is to mix low energy with high energy. So if your activities for Israel Day are you know, a performance or a big show is one of the main activities, when they come in, and that might be an opportunity to do an activity where it's low focus, right? If it's three, four, five-year-olds, maybe it's as simple as drawing in the cutouts of your Israel flag. It doesn't have to be the main component of your program, but when you have an activity ready, when kids come in, it's that special greeting. Um, and that clap is a great way of sort of like, hi guys, we're about to get started, rather than sort of like, hey group, we're gonna be doing this, um, you know, welcome to, can you quiet down and, and, and huddle up? Um, so these ideas of gaining kids' focuses that way. Um, and for those of you that are working with kids routinely, setting up a ritual, and setting up a habit that the beginning of this class or this program is going to start this way and the end is going to end this way so that every time in the beginning, whether it's a song that you sing or whether it's an activity or uh, a chant, that that becomes part of the program. One, it makes your programming easier because there's a consistency. Um, and two, it, it actually means less programming that you have to do because you've already designed things that are going to be part of that particular day. Um, yeah. We also, uh, in terms of you know that before time, uh, you, you you talked about an activity, but the one thing that I would like to talk about, and something that we always do, we love to arrive to activities early so that we start to get to know the kids, we start interacting with them. It's it's always important for you to know sort of where their headspace is at, you know, that day. Uh, thinking about maybe they have a lot of energy and you need to match that energy or you know they've been they've been doing these very cerebral things because they've been testing at school all day and, and so maybe you need something a little bit more light and creative and having that time and having the conversations beforehand starting to create that connection with kids will you know when you start your activities you'll be able to engage them very quickly because you already have a rapport you have a relationship and which is huge in, in education and facilitating for sure we like to create a sense of mystery we want it to feel different we were looking at um, some of the YouTube webinars for this you know we we actually start to go oh this, what we're doing is a little bit different. And, and actually those fear receptors for me started to, to tap in. Is this gonna fit into the structure that they had? A lot of these things that we're talking about now. Um, but you have to be willing to say, let's do things differently. You know, children respond to things that look and feel different. Um, that's why we set up this space a little bit differently. Um, so we're sitting behind tables rather than, there's two of us instead of one in case you didn't notice. Um, and also, there's this big bag that's been sitting here. I don't know if you can see it as well as this scarf. Ryan, do you want to talk here. about those? Absolutely. So we're talking about this idea of mystery because it's so engaging, especially for 
you know, early childhood, sort of elementary and middle school kids, they, the sense of mystery gets them excited. What's going to happen? What's going, you know, what is this thing? So if you imagine your space is blank, you're, you, there's a certain way that you have it always, maybe facing the chairs the other way. You know? Maybe you decide to facilitate at another point of the room, maybe you always stand at the beginning, or, I'm sorry, front of the room, maybe go to the back or, or to the side, changing things up. And, and of course, sometimes we like to lay things out. Um, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but you know, we've had this scarf over here to the side of the table, and maybe you've been thinking, what, what is that for? And generally, that's what the kids start to think, what's going on here, what's going on here. And it becomes a great management tool because they will ask, Kids are very curious. They will ask, what's that? What are we doing? What's going on? And the great management thing to say is, oh, that's for something that we're going to be doing later. And, and then you can get into your expectations and the sort of things that you want to do. Uh, and then when you get up to it, you know, you can pull it and say, oh, well, this, this is a scarf, or this is a hat, or this is a, a snake, ah, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, but keeping, building that mystery, can also help them. And, and that's just in terms of getting them engaged initially. Uh, of course, these things can turn into activities, uh, and, and maybe some of them are, but building that mystery to keep them engaged and keep them excited and changing things up. Uh, I know previously we mentioned structure, um, but if you creatively uh, throw in these uh, you know, bumps in the road or things of mystery or exciting new things, it can incite you know, excitement, uh, because of course in this very bite-sized world, you know, we, we see things in spans of 20, 30 seconds, and then, you know, we sort of get bored, and I think that's the idea there, is that this is something different, and it's something for them to latch on to. So we talked about sharing stories, right, and, and I think that from a planning perspective, especially if you work with older children, this idea of what's cool for you? Like, what do you want to see? What do you like? You know, oftentimes we think planning for children, that's a different person, that's a different world. And we'll be talking in just a second about three, four, five, six-year-olds. But even still, with the youngest, youngest kids, you think about what kind of activities, what interests you, um, it's going to make you a more successful facilitator by being able to relate those to your stories. Um, kids learn different ways. Uh, there's, I'm sure you've heard about varieties of, of theories about different learners. We use um, the auditory learners, people who learn through hearing. Visual, they want to see things. There's read-write, sort of people who process through that action. And then there's sort of kinetic learners. There are people who learn through sort of doing and experiential components. Everybody has pieces of that together. Mm -hmm. But when we try to plan a program that is has innovation, it's, it's going to utilize all of those pieces. So how to, how to process sound, how to process visual, how to incorporate a craft or an art, as well as how to make it experiential. If you can, when you design your program or you plan to include elements of all of those, you're going to be mixing it up um, and that's going to have a, a good impact. Um, also, we love to use, especially for younger kids, we love to use characters. Well, what kind of characters, Matt? Well, I'm so glad that you asked, Ryan. Well, it was right here on my paper. I was oh, to... <laughs> you are so silly. <laughs> you are so silly, Oh, Ryan. Draco! Oh, here's my hand. I was looking for it. Yeah, Draco, everyone. This is Draco. Hi, Hi everybody! Draco, we're actually on a live webcast right now. We're live! Yeah, absolutely. Hi. Yeah, absolutely. Uh. But That's a little so, scary. Uh, it, it's not. Nothing to be afraid of. Nothing to be afraid of. <sighs> yeah. So, Draco. Yes. Do you, you, I heard that you were on a trip last week. Would you like to tell I me? I was on a trip. Yeah. I went to Israel. Oh, it's true. Wow. Is it it, going it's been beautiful. To oh, I oh, you have? Too. Oh, lovely. Good for you. Good for you. And what sort of things did you see? I'm so experience? glad that you asked. Now, because we have a younger audience here, it's really important that I can set the rules in the beginning, just like I was doing earlier, just like Matt was doing earlier. Yes, thank you, Draco. Yes, just like Matt was doing earlier. But because there's younger kids, what about the first impression of doing my explanations and explaining everything 
as the character. So yes, I went to Israel and I love Israel. Did you know Israel, Israel information as the character so the kids are listening and processing? In fact, did anybody bring any food from Israel for me? Oh, yes, I, th I think Johnny down in the front has uh, some matzah. Perfect. I believe that's made in Brooklyn. Uh, anyway. Well, okay. You can find Thank it. Draco, may I interrupt? No problem. So the idea is that the children are engaging with the puppet and doing interactive activities with the puppet, and then the puppet could go ahead and explain, today we're going to be doing this and this and this, and it's going to have this profound impact. Thank you, Draco. You're so helpful. Thank you. It was so nice to meet you guys. Bye, Draco. Want to give you a Good pound? High five. High five. All right, pound. All right. All right. Shalom. See you later. Bye. Shalom. Bye. Bye, everybody. Wow. Crazy guy. Crazy, Crazy guy. guy. Totally. Love working with him. He though. is great. He's really easy to work. That whole fire breathing thing is a little bit of an yeah, issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, obviously. So working with characters for three, four, five, six-year-olds really, really has a great impact. Um, what are some other effective facilitation techniques for three, four, five-year-olds? Well, I think one thing that we've started to get on, especially with the character, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons I think characters work so well is because of the voice modulation. Uh, you know, our kids can become very familiar with our voice, and when they're distracted or they want to do something else, it's very easy for them to sort of tune it out, especially if there's a lot of things going on at, at the same time. Um, and, and so this is the idea with characters and in your own voices. Using voice modulation and maybe picking it up up here now so that the kids sort of clue in that there's something different going on. Or, guys, you gotta listen. Get really close because this is something that's gonna be happening now. I, I enjoy that one so much, especially when they're such high energy and I need to bring them down. That goes back to the idea of mysteries. What you're saying, so I have to be quiet in order to do so. You know, another thing is um, is call and response works mm -hmm. really well with these ages. So the idea of when I say this, I would need you to do this, and you could try to trick them. You know, when I say hotel, going against that wall, motel, hotel, mm -hmm. hotel, and they go against the wall. Um, it sort of keeps a lot of that momentum going. We talk a lot about downtime, and one of the one of the recommended uh, practices that we would have you do is when you look at, let's say a class setting. When are the times where we don't really have structured formal programming? If you're, you know, working at a summer camp, what are the days when what are the times when the kids kinda get into trouble, you know? Um, and planning for those times and looking at those downtimes. So these idea of call and response and voice as effective ways of managing those times are really important. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about kids learn in different ways and, and so those visual those visual learners Something really important is to think about drawing their attention to where you need it to be. Um, got about uh, and then, so what you, what I suggest is, you know, maybe having a clown nose or something, especially with the younger kids, and just sort of putting it on and talking like this now with a little bit of a character. And maybe a little too frightening. Maybe a little bit too frightening. Maybe clowns are good for everyone. But the idea is drawing the attention to your face, because I, I go into schools and after school programs and I always hear, you know, look at the ceiling, look at the floor, eyes on me, you know, sort of this, this thing that we all do, and it, and it does work and it's great. Uh, but this is sort of a different way of, uh, you know, instead of, hey, everyone, look at me. You know, once one kid notices something different, maybe you have a wacky hat, um, then, you know, that attention will start to come to you. And, it, and it's about focusing their attention where it needs to be uh, without demanding it or, or being invasive as well. Um, I think another uh, effective method, if I may, mm. is to use, for younger kids, to use props. Props. Where did that chicken come from? <laughs> there is a, a proven fact that every child laughs at a rubber chicken regardless of the age and they all want to play with it. Um, it's like the idea of a talking stick, right? It's the idea of instituting, when I'm holding this, I'm the person that's speaking. But that's just the very tip of the beak, if you will. <laughs> the opportunities you know, to encourage creativity with a simple object you know, whether it's just simple or how you did it with a scarf, right? It's a cell phone. Um, how we pass the chicken around the circle while a child is uh, 
sharing some information so that we know that the group is actually engaging with what's happening. Um, has a lot of a value as well as sort of holding it to sort of show that there's something happening here and that eyes should again should be staying on the person. Uh, moving right along, I think uh, you know we sort of focused a little bit on these techniques that are great for a younger younger group. I, I think it's a nice time to sort of switch the lens to teens, teens and, and older kids and, and the question that we always get, and, and we know it's difficult, and this is something that we're always working on and sort of playing with as well, is how do we engage our teams? How do we come up with good programming? How do, how do we just get them to listen and be engaged? Uh, um, and one of the things uh, that is great is this idea of high energy and, 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 and low energy, or, or taking your activities because the you know a team there's that awkward phase they they don't know when where they want to participate you know there's that self uh, um, you know they don't have a whole lot of confidence in themselves and and so this concept of uh, high focus and low focus activities high focus activities are activities that are very specific to one person we're focusing all of our attention on you um, and I think in, in order to create community and be beginning to build something, especially with teens, you want to do something that's a little bit more low focused. Maybe high energy, but low focus, and that means that the focus, the larger focus, is on the entire group. It's a little bit more group oriented, and, and one person is not put on the spot. Uh, I found the teens, you know, uh, especially at the beginning of building a, a rapport, an educational rapport, having high focus things can, can really turn them off right away. Sure, right, and it's that idea of, of what am I going to do and standing here in front of people. Mm -hmm. um, with upper elementary kids, it's the same concept. Splitting kids into groups and playing team games is extremely in, uh, effective. So if you're doing an Israel day and you've got three through six graders, you might want to split the kids into teams when you play your activities. They don't have to play for points. Points are great, but they could be imaginary points with an invisible billion dollars as your prize. The idea is that kids are like, wow, I'm working with this group and I have a goal to put together. Um, and so, for instance, if you had upper, upper elementary kids, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, you might split them into challenges that um, you could bulk as, let's say, you know, IDF challenges with different creative elements involved in them that work through stations. That's going to be more effective than with three, four, five, six-year-olds where the audience-based learning is still something they're very comfortable with. Um, you want to think participatory, you want to think interactive, and you want to think groups where they can share with the other kids. Um, I, I enjoy this idea always of, of thinking like an adult thinking like an adult, especially when it comes to teens. I think, uh, you know, sometimes being in the position that we are, you know, of, of handing over and offering information, um, you know, this sort of idea of knowing more, um, you know, and not giving a, a teenager uh, the, the, the respect or, or the sense of ownership that they deserve. And I think, you know, if you thought about your programming and, and said, I would enjoy this programming, I would do this programming, I would do this, then it's probably perfect for teens. You know, they, they, there's that sense of they want to feel grown up, they want to they be treated like adults in, in that sort of sense. And so if you think about your programming in a way that you would enjoy it or you're actually creating for other adults, uh, they will certainly uh, respect you for it and, and, and sort of realize that you're giving them that mutual respect and be more willing to be engaged. And the last thing I would recommend for teenagers, and some of you might disagree with me wholeheartedly, but the fact of the matter is, this is what teenagers want, and this is what teenagers are going to get anyway, is technology, mm -hmm. it's social media. You will be so much more successful with teens building a program structure that allows for check-ins on Facebook or you know retweeting tweets that are related. That's going to first off drive interest and a lot of people have problems getting teenagers to want to do anything. And a lot of the times we, and 
I'm not so old and I do feel this way, I go, we need to do it outside of technology. All they're doing at home is X, Y, Z, Twitter, Pinterest, blah, 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 blah. But the fact is the kids, they don't want that. That's not where they are now. So there has to be a balance of like how you can not ignore that and how you can implement it. Um, we do a like a, a live social wall where we would post comments and kids can write like like they're really on Facebook, only they're writing it on the wall and it's something that allows for live integration. Um, but it's that idea of not being afraid of what's hip and what's new and trying to integrate that into your program structure. Sure, and I think in that sense, also for us who are a little bit older, it, it goes back again to that fear of, you know, I don't know what technology is going to be perfect. Give that ownership over to, to your community and say, hey guys, I want to create this program. You know, speaking to the kids specifically, I want to create a program, but I don't know what apps are out there. I don't know, you know, what songs would help me with this. And if they, if they all of a sudden have a chance to make an impact on the program that they're going to be able to participate in, you, you know, they're already interested, you know, because they have that investment into it. Perfect. Yeah. I, let's let's talk about some some actual case studies. Some, you know, now that we've sort of laid out a little bit of the, and by the way, I mean in this limited amount of time, we can really only touch upon some of the basic philosophies and and, and theories. Um, but you know, you could go to mainstages.com. We have a blog there where we're posting comments all the time, um, and we're constantly running programs as a community calendar. So um, we're here to help you with ideas and help generate um, concepts uh, because. There is a real possibility to engage children to build their Jewish identity through creativity and whether that's Jewish values or connection to um, the holidays or, you know, uh, furthering their own halakhic interests. The idea is to, is to come at it from a creative method and creative structure and that's what we're aiming to do here. Um, so let's give you some exact, some case studies, okay? What works with three, four, five, six-year-olds? So Drake goes out here and he's saying it's Israel Day. What's the actual creative program that we're going to do? Um, one great resource is PJ Library. Uh, we we do a PJ Library storybook theater series, and what that is is uh, PJ Library. If you're not familiar, are children's books that are given for free to children across the country, and they cover all sorts of holidays and values and philosophies and theories. And they make great stories and great interactive pieces um, to supplement any activity that you're doing. So if you're working at younger kids, take a look at those stories and figure out how you might be able to adapt them. That's a great resource. Um, teenagers. We did something called Ken Low Cards. It's as easy as a small blue and a small white card. And we ask a question, an open-ended question, or we make a comment um, about something related to um, culture or politics, again, things that are adult in nature for teenagers, and if they agree with the comment, they would lift the blue card for Ken, if they disagree, they lift the white card for Low. And just by giving them that hands-on, now at the same time it allows them to share their viewpoint, but they're also part of a group. They're not standing up and saying, this is what I do or don't believe in. Uh, these programs you find have a, a high impact. Uh, one thing that I really like uh, that, that we've done before is this idea of the mitzvah garden or mitzvah wall. Uh, mitzvah rocks, you know, you, you paint a bunch of different rocks that look like really, you know, cute kids with the wiggly eyes and, you know, the, the yarn hair. Um, and the idea is, is that uh, within your community, you know, maybe this could be something throughout the day of your Israel day. And this idea of you see somebody doing something good, helping somebody, or, or um, you know, taking care of somebody that got hurt, um, that sort of thing. You can uh, nominate somebody, and, and they get a mitzvah rock, and there's a huge presentation at the end of the day of all the people that have gotten mitzvah rocks, and then you have a designated place uh, for these rocks to be laid, and everyone can sort of see it, and it has their name on it, and uh, sort of gets the... Uh, you know, it's that positive spin instead of, you know, these younger kids sort of telling on each other. It's like, these are the great things that the people are doing. Right, so it's that idea. It could be a simple smiley sticker, right? Mm -hmm. By right. getting creative and thinking in an innovative way, we're tying it into that theme while also still giving that ownership and, like, letting the kids participate and rep representing, recommending 
seeing what these behaviors that they're doing. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are some basic ideas um, in terms of some of the creative ideas that can come out of thinking in some of the ways that we've that we've promoted. Um, we have a lesson plan. So after all this, where we talk about adaptability and um, an ability to improvise, we, we did also mention that there's a structure. There's this set beginning, middle, and an end. So you've started, to recap, right? We've started with our expectations and what our goals are and your goals and what we're going to try and do together as a team. And we talk a little bit about um, brainstorming, how to prepare your staff, how to let yourself be open for it. And then we looked a little bit at what are some of the styles and facilitation techniques for younger kids, what are some of the facilitation techniques for older kids, um, and then look at a little bit of case studies. But what is really, really crucial here is, is writing them down, is getting them into a system and getting them into a program and a lesson plan. For sure, for sure. And it's the, the, we go back to the simple idea of a, a beginning, a middle, and then you know your opening activity. Maybe you know for the younger kids, it's it's a puppet, or for older kids, uh, you know maybe playing some music for them just to dance and have a good time and, and just get things started. Uh, and then you want to think to the middle. What is your main activity? Where's the meat and potatoes? And and that's the sort of activity or, or time that you can do Ken Lo cards. Or for younger kids, you're doing this PJ Library book and you're sharing this wonderful story in in variety. Um, and the one thing that I always love to tell all the facilitators, a teacher and educator, have a backup plan. And then have a backup plan for the backup plan. That'll feed into your adaptability, that'll feed into your creativity, as well as thinking about when you meet those kids at the very beginning, maybe there's something that you need to change. And then, of course, the ending, this idea of a closing ritual, uh, something that brings you all together at the very end to sort of recap the day. Um, maybe reflection questions, um, you know, this uh, one idea is using a ball with reflection questions on it. You stand in a circle and you pass the ball and wherever your thumb, right thumb lands, that's the question that you answer. So maybe it's something like, what did you learn today? Um, wh what did you already know today? And, and how did that, how did today change your perspective? Those sorts of questions and those are great activities to do at the end. Um, but yes, a, a backup plan for the backup plan, backup, 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 and that feeds into downtime. You know, if you get through your lesson and there's some downtime, you have extra activities to fill in those 10, 15 minute voids. If you don't have a puppet in a bag like we did, it's accessible. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I mean, by the way, uh, any of the resources that we sort of mentioned, from the brainstorm techniques to our lesson plan templates and structures, um, or some of the notes of what we shared, we'd be happy to share them with you. Um, you can email me, I'm matt at mainstages.com. Ryan at mainstages.com. And um, you can find us on all social media. Um, we hope that you had a great time with us today, um, and we would love to continue this conversation with you uh, offline. And um, if there were there any questions. questions. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And, uh, Have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you.